For nine years following the Civil War, Texas was in turmoil as its people attempted to solve political, social, and economic problems produced by the war. Emancipation changed the labor system and the end of slavery forced a redefinition of the relationship between blacks and whites. The change in labor and the costs of the war threatened to undermine the economic power of those who had dominated antebellum economic life, which was focused on the plantation. The weakening of the antebellum elite threatened not only their economic and social position, but also their political power. In 1865, Texas confronted a situation in which new directions could be taken in economic development, political alignment, and social order. The period of Reconstruction presented the old order with a critical challenge. One of the major forces that threatened change in the state was the United States Army. Federal troops began entering the state in late May 1865. Their commanders believed that their duty, at least in part, was to ensure loyal government and to protect the rights of the blacks who were free as a result of the war. General George A. Custer, stationed at Austin, expressed the military view when he recommended that the Army retain control of the state until the government was satisfied that a loyal sentiment prevails in at least a majority of the inhabitants. The military insistence upon loyalty threatened an indefinite loss of power among antebellum and wartime political leaders. Military views regarding the freed men posed, at least in the minds of white Texans, a permanent disruption of the labor system and subsequently their entire economy. Their fears proved groundless, at least for the most part, for a variety of factors prevented the army from affecting all of the change of which it seemed capable. Rapid demobilization reduced within a year the number of troops in the state from 51,000 to 3,000, and many of those who remained were on the frontier. The small size of the occupying army thus guaranteed its ineffectiveness. Still, various military commanders attempted to intervene in local politics. Turnover among them, however, presented the development of a sustained policy in Texas. From May 1865 to March 1870, the command of forces in the state changed eight times. Of the commanders, Charles Griffin was the most active politically, but his career ended with his death in September of 1867. His successor, Joseph J. Reynolds, was also politically active, though changes in command over him and his own indecisiveness and incompetence frustrated his forays into local politics. Wavering but domineering army policies ultimately provoked the local white population into an obstinate defense of pre-war political power and control over the black population. The formation of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, the Freedmen's Bureau, presented a further threat to pre-war society. This agency began its operations in the state in September of 1865 under the command of Major General Edgar M. Gregory. The Bureau was charged with overseeing all matters concerning refugees, freedmen, and abandoned lands, but its principal role was helping the new freedmen make the transition from slavery to freedom. Gregory, an abolitionist, interpreted his chief goal in the state as establishing a free labor system for the former slaves. Despite white fears, the course of Gregory and his principal successors, Joseph B. Cadu, Charles Griffin, and Joseph J. Reynolds, proved very conservative. Within a year, Gregory's labor policy stabilized the black labor force. He pressured blacks to stay where they were and to sign contracts to work for wages or on shares. Without land of their own, the freedmen had no alternative to going back to work for others. While planters complained publicly that free black labor was not as good as slave, in private, most found the new situation of tenantry acceptable. The indebtedness of tenants to landlords contained its own mechanism for controlling the freedom of the labor force. Though they possessed freedom to search for the best conditions 
among local landowners, blacks had few choices other than to labor on some other person's land. Other aspects of the Bureau's work were not as acceptable to whites. They saw attempts to educate the freedmen as potentially destructive to good order. They also criticized the intervention of agents and Bureau courts in situations where Bureau agents charged that blacks were being treated unjustly. The Bureau adjudicated matters ranging from violence to adherence to labor contracts. However, the challenge represented by Bureau schools and courts was always more in appearance than reality. The schools did not receive the financial support necessary to serve the large black populations. The courts were inadequate for the protection of the freedmen and irritated the whites brought before them. The Bureau had little effect and, like the Army, served to provoke whites to even greater opposition. Presidential Reconstruction presented a third, more substantial threat to antebellum order. Under this plan for restoring the South to the Union, the president was to appoint a provisional governor for each state. The provisional governor was required to call a convention in order to nullify the act of succession to abolish, uh, to abolish slavery and to repudiate the state's Confederate debt. The delegates to the convention had to take an oath of amnesty as prescribed by the president and were to be elected by voters who all had also taken that oath. Once the voters had ratified the work of the convention, they would elect a governor, a legislature, and other state officials. When the legislature had ratified the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the state would be fully restored to the Union. In accordance with this plan, President Andrew Johnson appointed Andrew J. Hamilton provisional governor of Texas. Hamilton represented elements of the antebellum opposition to the dominant Democratic Party and received a great deal of support from Texas Unionists. The requirement of the oath of amnesty was designed to exclude much of the antebellum political leadership from the convention and to allow the Unionists to rise to power in its place. The success of this party would mean a different distribution of the resources of state government and the acceptance of a broader definition of freedmen's rights than any of the old order were willing to permit. In fact, Hamilton failed to prevent the resurgence of the Democrats. In the election held in January 8th of 1866, the pre-war power structure reasserted itself. This was made possible by the fact that Although this group had suffered economically, their losses were only relative. The war had not driven them from their control of the state's economic life. They now demanded political power again. And even though excluded by the provisions of the presidential reconstruction, many voted and ran for the convention. When the delegates assembled at Austin in February of 1866, they included a large number of prominent pre-war and Confederate leaders, including H.R. Runnels, O.M. Roberts, R.S. Walker, and the Confederate General T.M. Wall. They made some concessions to the Reconstruction situation, however, and in the Constitutional Convention of 1866, they shared power with moderate Unionists, those who were willing to make concessions to the Democrats. Members of the coalition called themselves conservatives and they elected James W. Throckmorton, a unionist from Northeastern Texas as president of the convention. The proceedings of the convention showed the reluctance of the majority to meet anything more than the president's minimum requirements for readmission to regular status in the union. The delegates renounced the right of succession and proclaimed the state's act of succession null and void. Unionist delegates attempted unsuccessfully to have succession declared null and void ab initio from the beginning. The delegates also declared their acceptance of the abolition of slavery and granted blacks basic rights, but did not concede black suffrage or voting. They repudiated the state's war debt. Finally, in an action that fueled controversy through the rest of Reconstruction, they validated all laws of the state government during the war that were not in conflict with the United States Constitution, the state constitution prior to secession or proclamation of the provisional governor. They sat 
an election of ratification at which officials were also elected for June 25th, 1866, and the, the proposed constitution passed. Voters also had to select state officers and choose between a conservative ticket headed by Throckmorton a union, and a unionist one led by former governor Elisha Peace. The campaign centered on charges that Peace represented the interests of radical Republicans in the North and supported extension of suffrage to the freedmen, in other words, giving right, blacks the right to vote. The power of antebellum politicians again asserted itself when Throckmorton handily carried the election by a vote of 49,277 to 12,168. The 11th legislature met on August 6, 1866, and Throckmorton took office six days later. The governor's efforts at securing recognition were hindered by the many former secessionists who dominated the legislature. These men selected two prominent secessionists, O.M. Roberts and David G. Burnett, for seats in the United States Senate. The legislature's actions attempted to return the state as much as possible to the status quo antebellum. They refused to ratify the 13th Amendment and 14th Amendment. The members also enacted black codes, a series of measures designed to regulate black labor through apprenticeship, contract labor, and vagrancy laws. These labor laws appeared to unionists in Texas and Republicans in the North to be an attempt to establish a new form of slavery. Such activity convinced even those unionists who had not remained outside the conservative coalition that the former Confederates were back in control and unrepentant. It raised similar doubts in the minds of the local military commanders, the assistant commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, and the members of Congress. Neither the senators chosen by the legislature nor the congressmen elected by Texas voters were allowed to take their seats in Washington. Throckmorton himself increased tension by his complaints against the army for interfering in civil affairs and in efforts to protect the frontier from Indian raids by fielding raging companies. Throckmorton believed that the Army and the Freedmen's Bureau meddled unreasonably in civil affairs and that the Army was not doing its duty on the frontier. In turn, military officials and unionists believed that Throckmorton, relying on local justice, had brought about a situation in which die-hard Confederates persecuted and even murdered blacks and unionists without punishment. They also feared the governor's rangers were intended as a political organization to block reconstruction as much as to fight Indians. Congress brought the course of Throckmorton, the legislature, and presidential reconstruction to an end on March the 2nd, 1867, with its first Reconstruction Act. The law broke the South into military districts under the command of the army and declared the existing governments to be provisional. Texas was placed in the fifth military district from the beginning. General Griffin, commander in Texas, differed from Throckmorton on policy and on July the 30th, 1867, at the request of Griffin, General Philip H. Sheridan, commander of the district, removed Throckmorton from office as an impediment to reconstruction. In his complaints to Sheridan, Griffin cited Throckmorton's failure to qualify for office under the military bill, the first Reconstruction Act, and his refusal to cooperate in the punishment of those who had committed outrages against loyal men, white and black. Following Throckmorton's removal, complaints from unionists, blacks, and Freedmen's Bureau officials about local officials who refused to protect their lives and property continued to pour into military headquarters. Griffin began to move towards removing those local offices, but little was done towards this and before his death in the yellow fever epidemic that swept through the eastern portions of the state the summer and fall. His successor, Joseph J. Reynolds, continued to receive complaints and with a series of special orders began wholesale removals in the fall of 1867. The most sweeping of these special orders, number 195, issued on November 1st, 1867, removed more than 400 county officials in 57 counties across the state. 
Four days later, Reynolds removed the elected city officials of San Antonio, and the day after that, their terms having expired, he replaced the officials in Austin. The men Reynolds appointed to replace these removed officials had to be uh, capable of taking the test oath passed on con uh, by Congress on July the 2nd, 1862, stating that they had never voluntarily borne arms against the United States or given aid, countenance, consul, and encouragement to persons engaged in armed hostility thereto. The removals continued until most counties in the state had at least one county official removed. Many local elected officials who remained in office after Reynolds' removals of late 1867 and early 1868 were forced to leave office in April 1869 when General Edward R.S. Canby ruled that every office filled by an elected official incapable of taking the test oath would be considered vacant on April 25, 1869. Under the provisions of Congressional Reconstruction, Texans had to take new steps for restoration. The state had to have another constitutional convention with delegates elected by all male citizens over the age of 21, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Only felons and those who had been disenfranchised for their part in the rebellion could not participate. Congress required that the convention write a new state constitution that would provide for universal adult male suffrage. When the Constitution had been written and the state had ratified the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, Congress would consider the case for readmission to the Union. In the spring and summer of 1867, political parties organized in preparation for the new Constitutional Convention. Unionists' active participation in forming the state's Republic, Republican Party linked them with black voters who would for the first time be allowed to take part in the political process. The biracial nature of the party led its opponents to refer to it usually as the radical party. In fact, like the unionists, the new party reflected diverse interests, regional concerns, economic interests, race, and ideological considerations provided the motivating force behind those who joined this party. Blacks organized under white sponsorship in the Union League. A major weakness of this new organization was that its members shared little in common other than their opposition to the power and the policies of the conservatives. Still, that opposition meant that their electoral triumph threatened to bring about a potential political revolution. Those opposed to the coming convention were not sure, sure exactly how to respond. Their leaders at first encouraged voters to stay away from the polls and to ensure that the convention did not receive a majority of votes. On January 30, 1868, conservatives met at Houston and concluded that their supporters should vote against a convention and for conservative delegates, stating that they preferred military rule to the Africanization that would result from the convention. The result was that most conservatives did not even bother to register or to vote. The radicals carried the election by a vote of 44,689 to 11,440. The turnout indicated that most white Texans either did not believe that they had a real say in the election or they did not care. For a little more than half of the eligible voters cast ballots. The convention met at Austin on June the 1st, 1868, and did not adjourn until February of 1869. Though the delegates devoted as much time to special interest legislation as to drafting the basic document, the constitution they wrote differed significantly from previous constitutions. It authorized a more centralized and bureaucratized government uh, uh, with greater power in the hands of the governor who received extensive powers of appointment, including the right to name district judges. The centralizing tendencies of the Constitution later proved to be controversial, but in the convention, this strengthening of executive power was one of the few issues that did not produce conflict between Democratic and Republican can, uh, delegates. No matter what the strengths or weaknesses of the proposed Constitution were, its drafting produced political turmoil. The Assembly uncovered major weaknesses within the new Republican Party. 
After disagreeing over many measures in the Constitutional Convention, the party split over the same issues at their convention in August 1868. A.J. Hamilton and E.M. Peace led what came to be known as the moderate wing of the party. Edmund J. Davis, James P. Newcomb, and Morgan C. Hamilton dominated the radical wing. The terms moderate and radical referred to uh, primarily to the party's willingness to grant rights to blacks or to make concessions to former Confederates. But the split also reflected differences over economic and other policies as well. The radical Republicans supported greater rights for blacks, more restrictions on Confederates, and paradoxically a more cautious program of economic development. The moderates, however, controlled the convention and included the new Constitution liberal provisions restoring the franchise to former Confederates. The particular concession caused the radicals to oppose at Washington the holding of an election to ratify the proposed Constitution. The moderates, however, urged the Grant administration to accept the document, and when it became clear that the Grant administration would hold an election for ratification and for state offices, the two factions each put candidates into the field. The Texas Constitution of 1869 would extend full voting rights to African Americans by recognizing and ratifying the 13th and 14th Amendments, and would expand the responsibilities of state government, giving it expanded and more centralized powers and authority. This would in turn anger the more conservative members of the Texas Democratic Party, who were also dominated by former Confederate sympathizers. Texans began preparing for an election in the spring of 1869 though the election was not held until the following December. The two Republican factions ran opposing tickets. The radicals selected the men who had led them to the convention, Edmund J. Davis and the moderates chose A.J. Hamilton. Hamilton actively pursued support among the former Democratic leadership in the subsequent campaign. The two factions actively jockeyed for support for the administration of President Ulysses S. Grant, support that ultimately went to Davis, which received federal patronage after September 1869. Grant's support helped Davis to get the black vote. On January 11th of 1870, General Reynolds declared that the new constitution had been ratified and that Edmund J. Davis had received an 800 vote majority. Hamilton Stewart, a newspaper editor received 380 votes. On February 8, 1870, the elected members of the 12th legislature assembled at Austin at the order of the military commander. They were to adopt the 14th and 15th amendments and to select the United States senators in preparation for readmission to the Union. They quickly approved the amendments and selected Morgan C. Hamilton for a six-year term and uh, James W. Flanagan for a four-year term. This completed the requirements set by uh, Congress for readmission, and on March 30, 1870, President Grant signed the act that readmitted Texas to the Union and ended Congressional Reconstruction, and Texas would become the last of the former Confederate states to be readmitted to the Union. On April 26, 1870, the 12th Legislature reconvened in a special session and initiated a program that addressed the numerous problems that had emerged since the war and that reflected the goals of the radical Republicans. As a whole, the program produced a significant increase in the role of state government, and it also demonstrated Republican commitment to change. Of the issues addressed, none provided more controversy than that of violence. Everyone agreed that lawlessness was rampant in much of the state, but parties could not agree about the cause. Certainly much of it could be attributed to the post-war breakup, Bands of uh, brigands roamed along the Red River in the Big Thicket country. Gangs led, uh, gangs led by such outlaws as Cullen Baker, and Benjamin Bickerstaff, and Bob Lee preyed upon the people of northeastern Texas, though their targets often were freedmen or federal soldiers. These murderers and horse thieves could hardly be called political activists. On the other hand, much violence clearly had racial or political overtones. The Convention of 1868 reported that of 939 murders in the state between 1865 and 1868, 379 were murders of blacks committed by whites. 
1868, General Reynolds also reported that armed organizations generally known as the Ku Klux Klan, but locally referred to as Pale Face, Knights of the White Carmela, or the White Brotherhood were operating in areas east of the Trinity River. Their targets were blacks and union men. Although no evidence exists to prove a statewide organization, such groups clearly were political in motivation. As its chief measure to end the lawlessness, the legislature passed a state police bill and established a militia, which had among its responsibilities the support of the state police. Both forces were placed under the adjutant general for coordination. To aid the police, the legislature also expanded the district court system. Although controversy surrounded these measures from the beginning, the program appeared to achieve its goals. In 1871, the police made 3,602 arrests, and in 1872, the Adjutant General reported 1,204 arrests. In its first three years of existence, the police force recovered $200,000 in stolen property. Many of the state's citizens began to look to the force for protection. In addition, despite some early fears, the militia was used sparingly. Still, the police measures produced many enemies. Local citizens complained that police behavior was inappropriate. The use of the police to protect pools of voters during elections incensed the Republicans' opponents, who charged that the force was only a political organization. The fact that many of the policemen were blacks and had authority over whites did not help the reputation of the police. When Governor Davis used the militia, again composed frequently of blacks, to enforce order at the polls, that organization was also linked inextricably to the Republican regime. Declarations of martial law and the use of the militia in Madison, Hill, Walker, Limestone, and Freestone counties produced widespread condemnation. When Adjutant General James Davidson fled the state in 1872 with $34,434.67 of state money, he added to the darkened reputation of the police. Almost as controversial were Davis's government's school measures. The legislature did not produce a successful school until 1871, and this act inaugurated a highly centralized system of public schools. The state supported the schools in each county, selected and tested the teachers, determined a common curriculum, and provided for a grading system for three classes, primary, elementary, and advanced. The public education system headed by Jacob C. de Grasse grew rapidly. Enrollment peaked at 129,542, or 56% of the scholastic population in 1872 and 1873. But opponents raised objections to the education of blacks, compulsory attendance, centralization of authority, and cost. The schools generated enough enemies that they provided a major focus of democratic aversion. Other laws also provided a basis for criticism. Opponents condemned the law that set the first state election to be held after readmission in November of 1872, rather than November of 1871. This law gave the legislature a two-year term, as provided in the Constitution, but changed the election date set by the Constitution. An enabling act allowing the governor to appoint district attorneys, county treasurers and surveyors, cattle and uh, hide inspectors, public cotton weighers and mayors and aldermen, and to fill their vacancies until regularly scheduled elections was considered another dangerous appropriation of power. Republican aid to railroads produced less party strife and indicated the Republicans' belief in the need to encourage economic development. The first major act was the legislature's incorporation of the International Railroad Company which received $10,000 in 8% bonds for each mile of new road. In a later session, the legislature gave subsidies to Southern Transcontinental and Southern Pacific Railroads. Governor Davis vetoed these bills, contending that the state could support only one railroad, but a coalition of Democrats and Republicans overrode his veto. The legislature also authorized counties and towns to provide their own support for railroads through the issuance of bonds. In addition to the railroad measures, other laws designed to promote growth passed with little debate. The legislature passed two homestead laws to encourage immigration and farm expansion. The 
first allowed 160 acres of land each to heads of family who did not already possess a homestead. In turn, the homesteader had to occupy the land for three years and pay processing fees. Single men were allowed 80 acres. The settler wishing to less than 160 acres could buy land for a dollar an acre. The second law exempted from force sale a family homestead of not more than 200 acres of rural land or more than $5,000 worth of city property. Efforts were also made to encourage cotton and wool and textile factories by granting such concerns tax exemptions for up to five years on their stock and property used in production. The legislature also founded a bureau headed by Gustav Leffler to encourage immigration. Another component of the Republican program to produce little debate was its Indian policy. The state government wanted to get rid of the Indians. A frontier protection bill provided for ranging companies of troops, although they never funded sufficiently to have an effect. The Davis government's chief problem in Indian affairs was that the Republican federal government was trying to get Indians onto reservations, while most Texans wanted them exterminated instead. The height of this conflict came in October 1873, when Davis was pressured by the federal government into releasing the Kiowa chiefs Satanta and Big Tree, who had been imprisoned for a raid on a wagon train near Jacksboro. Davis won few friends by giving in. In fact, however, neither the state nor federal government settled the situation on the frontier until more aggressive tactics were introduced by General Ranald S. McKenzie in 1874. His defeat of the Comanches at Palo Duro Canyon was the first step towards removing the Plains Indians from the Texas frontier. The government's overall program produced many enemies. It offended too many different interest groups. The centralizing tendencies of many of the Republican measures, their susceptibility to abuse and their cost proved a common ground for opposition among a disparate majority, the basis of a coalition of moderate Republicans and Democrats that emerged in the early 1870s. The opposition peaked in its September 1871 in the Pre-Taxpayers Convention. This state convention, political in its nature and goals, aimed at rallying opposition to regular Republican candidates in the autumn congressional elections. Conservative businessmen who wanted to avoid taxes and planters who wanted to avoid turmoil in their black workforce joined the small farmers who, destroyed by the war, turned all of their anger into hatred of free blacks, the cause, it seems, of all their woes. They were allied men who would otherwise have been political enemies. The charges of high taxes proved the undoing of the Republican regime. Beginning with the 1871 elections, the party encountered one defeat after another. It was never able to recover. In 1871, the Democrats carried all four congressional seats. In 1872, they elected two new congressmen at large and more importantly gained control of the House and the 13th legislature. Only the staggered senatorial terms prevented the Senate from also falling to Democratic control. Even so, Republicans in the Senate now appeared eager to cooperate with their opponents in undoing much of the party's reconstruction program. The 13th legislature abolished the state police and altered the militia laws so that the governor could no longer declare martial law. The enabling act was also modified to provide for special elections to fill vacancies. The voting act was changed to make possible precinct voting and to end the practice of voting only at county seats. The legislature also effectively destroyed the state school system and placed school operations in the hands of local school boards and or school directors. Although the office of state superintendent was retained, it now involved many, uh, mainly record keeping duties. The resurgent conservatives did not interfere, however, with the economic programs of the 12th legislature. In December, 1873, the state had its first general election since 1869. Governor Davis ran again for the Republican nomination and received it, then campaigned in defense of his administration. The conservative coalition that had attacked Davis up to this point came apart, and for the first time since the war, the Democratic Party ran a regular candidate 
leaving their moderate Republican allies to move back to the Davis party or stay out of politics. After considerable internal upheaval, the Democratic Convention nominated Richard Koch on the fifth ballot. Koch supported the continued dismantling of the Republican program, although he favored a new constitutional convention. Davis secured strong support only in the Black Belt and some Western counties. Koch won easily 85,549 to 42,663, and for all practical purposes, the Republican effort was over. But one last step had to be taken to end legislative reconstruction. Houston Republican attempted to overturn the election in the case of ex parte Rodriguez, or as it was popularly called, the semicolon case. In ruling that the election was unconstitutional, the state Supreme Court set up a confirmation uh, and confrontation between Davis and the newly elected Koch, known as the Koch-Davis controversy. Davis refused to step down, arguing that he must enforce the decision of the court. Koch stated his intention to take office no matter what. In fact, Davis's only hope in the matter was for intervention by federal authorities since he faced overwhelming power in the hands of his opponents. When the president refused to intervene, Davis had to step down in January of 1874. The Democrats staged a military celebration at the state capitol, firing a 102 gun salute for the newly inaugurated Governor Koch and his Lieutenant Governor, Richard Hubbard. Koch's triumph marked a strong and lasting reaction to the Republican regime. Democrats controlled the state government for the next century. In 1875, Texans continued their efforts to erase Reconstruction by holding a convention to replace the Constitution of 1869. The undoing of Reconstruction was eventually completed when the Constitution of 1876 was adopted.